OK, let's get started. And welcome, everyone, to this session, Chaos Engineering for SQL Server. Thank you so much for coming. I'm aware it's the last session of the day. Don't worry, I'm not one of these people who overruns. We'll be out of here well on time, ready for the, I think there's a party going on at 6 o'clock after this. So we'll be out in plenty of time for that. Before we get into the session, just a little bit about myself. My name is Andrew Prusky. Uh, despite my name, I am originally from Swansea, Wales. My parents were my grandparents on my father's side were Polish, came over after the Second World War. My Polish is horrendous, so I'm really sorry that this session is in English. Um, but I'm now based in Dublin, Ireland, which is why my accent is a sort of mishmash of here, there, and everywhere. I've uh, been in Ireland now for this year is 10 years. Um, if, you ever, if you haven't been, highly recommend you go. I'm a field solutions architect with a company called Pure Storage. And before that, I was a SQL Server DBA for about 15 years. I'm a Microsoft Data Platform MVP, have been for the last five years. And my contact details are on the slide there. Twitter at DBA from the cold, and my email, DBA from the cold at gmail.com. If you have any questions after today, or you just want to talk about technology, please feel free to reach out. I'm always willing to talk about this stuff. The blogs there as well, dbafromthecold.com. I will warn you, my blog is a mishmash of generally anything I find interesting. So we've got Kubernetes, containers, SQL Server, Chaos Engineering, VMware, all this type of stuff. But I've got a couple of articles on Chaos Engineering on there, which some of which I'm using to base this session on, but some of them go to a little bit further information as well. And then finally, my GitHub account. All the slides and the code from the demos that we'll be doing today are on my GitHub account, and I'll post a link to the exact repo at the end of the session. So. What is the aim of this session? The aim of this session is to talk about chaos engineering. And let's, let's clear something up. It's a bit of a buzzword, chaos engineering. What we actually talk about is resiliency testing. But we like our buzzwords in technology, so let's go with chaos engineering. So what we're going to do is we're going to talk about its core principles, how it's been applied at certain companies, and a little bit of the history about it, where it came from. Then we'll talk about how we can identify potential weaknesses in our systems that we can test with chaos engineering experiments. And then we will actually run a chaos engineering experiment. Finally, to round the session off, we'll have a little bit of fun. Um, over the last, oof, I'd say, five, six years now, I've been kind of obsessed with running SQL Server in containers and Kubernetes. And it's a prime candidate for running chaos engineering experiments against. So we're going to run a chaos engineering experiment against SQL Server running in Kubernetes, just to round the session off. But first things first. What is chaos engineering? Now, I mentioned it's resiliency testing, but there's a really good definition here, and it's from the principles of chaos.org website. And this should be your first point of call if you're getting into chaos engineering. It's got a whole bunch of great references for you there. But the definition of the slide there is basically saying that chaos engineering is a discipline of experimenting on a system to see how it reacts when it encounters a failure. Does it react the way we expect it to, or does something else happen? If it reacts the way we expect it to, then we're building up confidence in our systems that, hey, I'm not going to get paged at 4 o'clock in the morning on a Sunday. Because it never goes down. It's never 4 o'clock in the afternoon on a Tuesday. It's always some, it seems to be Sunday morning is the prime time. Anyone else with me? Yeah. What we're doing is building up confidence in our systems so that when they encounter certain situations, they will react the way we expect them to and we don't get paged. If they don't react the way we expect them to, then we need to do some analysis of our systems to see what went wrong and then Make, probably make some configuration changes, make a deployment, and then run our test again. And hopefully that time, SQL Server, SQL Server or our systems, sorry, I'm a crusty old DBA. I'm going to say SQL Server, what I mean systems, will react the way we expect it to that time. So before we go any further, I want to clarify a couple of things, because I feel there are some misconceptions out there about chaos engineering. The first things first, chaos engineering is not breaking things in production. We are not here to break things. If I said to my manager, hey, we're going to start getting some, uh, a few more outages now in our production systems because I am a chaos engineer, I would be kicked out of that company pretty darn quickly. We're not here to break things in production. What we are here to do is define experiments and run them in an environment to see how our systems react. So with that being said, do we even need to go anywhere near production? Now, when you first start out, absolutely not. You can run this in a dev environment. You can run this in a staging environment. You can run this in a lab that you've built. And we will do that when we do the demos later on. So you don't need to go anywhere near production when you're first starting out. You can absolutely 
do this in a staging environment. Now, I will say, you're not going to get, say, going back to SQL Server, you're not going to get the size of the databases or, say, the throughput that you would in a staging environment that you would in your production environment, purely for the nature of the things. But you can ensure that your environments are configured the same. So if you have some sort of high availability solution for your SQL instances in your production environment, you need to have them in your staging environment as well. So that when you run your tests in your staging environment, you can be 99% sure your production systems will react the same way when you run your tests there. So we're not here to break things. We don't need to go near production. Okay, let's have a little, little bit of a history uh, of chaos engineering, and let's talk about a couple of implementations. Now, who here has heard of Chaos Monkey? One or two? Cool. All right, this is going to be good. Um, so back in August 2008, Netflix ex experienced a major outage which lasted three days. It was actually due to database corruption, so I don't know what their DBAs were doing for three days, but still, they were down for three days. This was back when Netflix was selling, still sending DVDs out of the post. Could you imagine if Netflix went down for three days now? During the pandemic, there'd have been riots. Anyway, they were down for three days. And when they finally got everything working again, brought everything back up, they decided to reevaluate their architecture. And they decided to move from a monolithic architecture in a data center to a distributed architecture in the cloud. And when they went to the cloud, they adopted the mindset of, in order to prevent failures, we will fail constantly. And out of that mindset, Chaos Monkey was born. Chaos Monkey's sole purpose is to go through their production environment and randomly turn off servers. Just randomly turn things off and see how the environment copes. The idea here is that if their systems cannot handle a semi-controlled outage, how are they going to handle an uncontrolled outage? How are the systems going to stay up? Is everything just going to fall over? So that is Chaos Monkey. And this is really where Chaos Engineering was born. Um, it's, <laughs> it's open source. It's uh, on GitHub here. You can go and download it and deploy it into your production environment. I highly recommend you don't do that. <laughs> but you can. It's there. It's all open source. That's what it's there for. Now, that is an example of a tool that can be used with Chaos Engineering. But chaos engineering is more of, I'd say, more of a set of principles or a mindset or a philosophy, if we get a little bit deeper. So let's talk about a couple of other implementations. You might hear of these companies, Slack and Google. Now, these are more a methodology of running chaos engineering experiments. Basically, what they're doing is getting their engineers together to talk about how their systems can fail and then designing experiments around it. And then you can see with Slack here, they run in development to build confidence in their systems. And then when they're ready, they then deploy to production, run the experiments in production, and see how their systems react to those tests. Do they react the way they expect them to? Then great, we've built up confidence. If they don't, then maybe there's a configuration issue there that needs to be addressed. And then we've got Google. Uh, it's called disaster recovery testing. I highly doubt they refer to it as DIRT but that's what it was on the website, so D-I-R-T, Disaster Recovery Testing. I really love this one, the SRE team motto. Hope is not a strategy. We don't hope that our systems are going to stay up. We want to define tests to prove that our systems will stay up when they encounter a failure. And we have automated and manual tests. And we're, going to do man we're going to run manual tests here, but you can do some really cool things in Azure with the Azure Chaos Studio, which I'll give you a little sh show of. And then the bottom one here, we have controlled chaos. We're not just going in into a server room and starting to rip out cables at the back. We are designing specific tests to test one thing and one thing only in our systems. We're not going in just, but look, any determined engineer can break something. If you're thinking, I'm going to take the systems down today, you are going to take that system down, right? What we're doing here is saying, right, I want to see how this system reacts when this happens. Does it stay up, does it go down? That's what we're trying to do here. It is a controlled chaos is what we're doing. So let's have a think about how we can get started with designing a chaos engineering experiment. The first thing we need to do is find some candidates of weaknesses in our systems that we can identify to run our experiments against. 
So the first thing we need to do is a complete environmental analysis. We need to know exactly what is running in our systems at all times. So I'm talking from experience here with DBAs. We tend to hyper-focus on the SQL Server instances and forget about everything else that's going on around there. We need to know what's going on in our entire environment. So we're starting from the ground up, and that's our infrastructure. Where are we running? Are we in a private data center? Are we on premises? Are we up in the cloud? Some sort of sharing thing going on. And what's running in those centers? Do we have virtual machines, physical machines, some sort of service architecture? Do we have a couple of Kubernetes clusters sitting in the corner scaring everyone? You know, what do we have running there? And then we're talking about our applications. As I said, hyper-focused on SQL Server sometimes, but what's hitting those SQL instances? How do those applications to react to that SQL instance going down? Do they just start spamming errors like there's no tomorrow, and we have to manually go in and fix something? Or is there some sort of retry logic in there that'll say, hey, wait, hang on. That SQL instance is available. I'll pause back off and retry in X amount of time. Monitoring. We need to know what monitors we have. Um, how are we going to analyze the results of our experiments? Now, you can eyeball these experiments, and we're going to do that in the demo that we do later on. But we want to gather as much data as we possibly can when we run these experiments to know exactly what happened. SQL instance went down, databases came back up, databases went into recovery. Databases stayed in recovery for X amount of seconds while the app was waiting for X amount of seconds. This amount of errors were generated. These types of errors were generated. We want to grab as much data as we possibly can. And finally, social. Guess what? You and your team are a point of failure. Who here has ever worked with someone who they're on a team and they installed the system, they maintain the system, they upgrade the system, they, are, they fix any issues with the system. They are the front of all knowledge for that one system. Anyone know, worked with someone like that? I have. I, I, I was that person. <laughs> um, take that person out of the room. How do the people in the other team do the, I don't like using this phrase, but metaphorically, they get hit by a bus. Take them out of the room. They're not available anymore. Simulate that system going down. Do the rest of the team have the knowledge to be able to bring that system back up? If they don't, do they have the ability to do they have the access to get that knowledge? And that could be the form in, I don't know, uh, say ADS notebooks, an internal wiki, run books, anything. Is that information there for them to grab? So from the down, uh, sorry, from the bottom all the way to the top, the social. We need to analyze our environment and make sure we know exactly what's going on before we go anywhere near designing a chaos engineering experiment. So once we've got our environment analysis, we can then start thinking about what, system, what failures we're going to test. And the best way to start is to have a look at what's happened in the past in the environment. What has previously gone wrong in your environment? Because those will be probably the best candidates for your test. And the reason for that is we want to actually have some actionable results from this. We want to test stuff that's actually going to happen or has happened in your environment. There is no point designing a chaos engineering experiment, running all the way through it, going, yes, it reacted the way we expected it to. And then some manager turning around going, the likelihood of that happening is negligible. You have wasted everyone's time with this chaos engineering nonsense. We are never doing this again. Go back to work. Right? And that's not what we want to happen here. So we want to talk about what's happened in the past and what could possibly happen in the future. Say right, we've got a standalone SQL Server instance running in production. That instance goes down. We bring it back up, and we decide that we want to build some sort of high availability technology into this to prevent that from happening again. So we could go with the standard one these days is always on availability groups. But we could go with mirroring. We could go with a failover cluster instance. We could go with replication, if you're crazy. Rep replication is a valid HA technology. I won't have anyone say otherwise, if you like pain. Say we build a always on availability group, uh, two node cluster. So we have a primary and a secondary. Primary goes down, secondary takes over. Fairly standard. Who here has built an always on availability group? Yep. What's the first thing you do when you build it? Alter availability group, fail over, fail over one, fail over two. Yeah, make sure it can fail both. That's not how an availability group is going to fail out in the wild. That's a really sanitized way of failing an AG over. What about 
just turning off the primary node and seeing what happens. Wouldn't that be a more realistic test of how things are going to fail over in the wild? Uh, fail in the wild. That could be a candidate for a chaos engineering experiment. And then we got what we've learned from those previous failures. Yes, we built a HA system. We've got that running now. We can run some tests against it. Okay, so we've got to pass instance and that. So I'm just best place to start. Uh, the other thing to do, and I drew this graph myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> hilariously bad at drawing stuff. All right, um, this is called a likelihood impact map, and it does exactly what you think it does. You start, you sit your team down and start talking about what could possibly go wrong in your environment. By the way, this is great fun. Have you ever sat engineers down and go, right, how can things break? It might take one or two t attempts to get some answers out of them, but once they start flowing, oh, they'll start flowing. And the idea here is you think about how things are going to fail, and you rake them on a map. We're saying how likely it is to happen and what is the impact of that happening. And you should get, hopefully, a nice spread across the graph with a, a few in the red area that are candidates. Now, with this, some people can be overly optimistic or overly pessimistic when they come to thinking about their environment. Uh, one guess on which way I go with that. If that happens and you get them bunched down in the green or bunched down in the red, zoom in, do it again, and hopefully you will get that nice spread across with hopefully three or four in that red area, and those are your candidates for your first chaos engineering experiments. Okay, so let's think about some potential scenarios that we can test. The first one, we've already talked about this, high availability. We have a bunch of AGEs in our production environment. How will that primary node fail? Now, we've got some options here with AGs, like we've got the DB status. We could just go in and turn off the production server. We could shut down the SQL server service and see how that AG reacts. Does it react the way we expect it to? Does it fail over from node, the primary node to the secondary and the listener stays online? Or does something else happen and there's some sort of config error there and we need to go fix it? Uh, let's think of another one, because we already talked about high availability, but let's do backups. Um, I would argue that taking backups are probably the number one job of a DBA. But I'd then caveat that with the ability to restore is probably the number one um, job of a DBA. How often do you test your backups? How often do you test restoring your databases? Now, this is an easy one chaos engineering experiment, really stretching the meaning here. But as I said before, things tend to break at 4 o'clock on a Sunday morning or 4 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. We don't want to be scrabbling around trying to find scripts when we need to restore a database. So we can have a system set up. And I had this running in pretty much every job I have. We have a server there with a bunch of scripts running that just randomly finds a database, grabs its backups, restores them, does a check DB against them, and then if anything goes wrong, fires off an email to me. Just run it constantly running in the background, making sure that those backups for those databases are always available to restore. They're always integral. We can get at them easily. And it can generate scripts and send them to you as well. So when, say, you have to do a point-in-time restore of a production database, you're not scrabbling around for scripts. You've got them there, ready to go. And we've also got a whole bunch of tools out there. Now, has anyone here used DBA tools, the PowerShell module? Yep, fantastic stuff. Nice and simple. Drop the date and time in there. It goes off, does everything for you. Um, so yes, testing the restores. Uh, Paul Randall used of uh, SQL Skills used to tell a story that he had a customer that was, a, I think it was a bank in America. And they took a full backup of their database every month, but then just log backups throughout the entire month. Now, they had, a, they had a corruption issue where they needed to restore. And the problem they had was they could do the database backup restore really fine. They had all the scripts, but it was thousands and thousands and thousands of log backups to restore. So they ended up being down for three days. And I don't think they actually recovered from that. It's not about backing up your databases. It's about testing your restores. And I speak from experience. <laughs> um, this is one, two, three, four, three jobs ago. Um, I was working in a company just in the UK, and I was using a third-party tool to back up all my databases. I was using a third-party tool because this was I was running SQL Server 2005, which didn't have native backup compression. This tool did. 
So I had a nice little GUI and I had all my backups running in there and everything was green. I was sitting there going, my backups are all compressed and lovely and I've got them, it's great. Until one day, a developer came up to me and said, look, we've accidentally deleted a whole bunch of data from this database. We need to do a point in time restore, for, say about half an hour ago. Database was three terabytes, not massive, but uh, substantial enough. I was like, no problem, I've got all my backups. I've got my little tool here with my GUI and everything's green. So I selected all my backups. When they execute, and at that point I noticed at the bottom this tool had a feature called Instant Restore. And I was like, Instant Restore? Who wouldn't want to instantly restore a three terabyte database? So I clicked the box, hit Execute, and the backup went all the way to 99% and stayed there for five hours and then failed. I hadn't been testing my restores using that feature so that when I really needed it, it didn't work the way I expected it to. The, um, the, out, the way I fixed it was I basically just re did the whole thing, removed the tick box, ran through the restores, which took another five hours, and we got the database back. But I didn't get a lot, didn't I half get a lot of jip in from all the developers? Like, I thought you said this was going to be an instant restore. I was like, yes, yes, all right, fine. We don't do instant restores anymore. But no, I hadn't been testing my systems. So that when I needed it, it didn't work the way I expected it to. Let's do another one. Let's do uh, monitoring. This is a really nice and easy one. Um, your monitoring systems are a point of failure. Uh, we used to use Nagios, and then I would send it off to PagerDuty and get paged on my phone. Um, that Nagios box didn't, it used to be a standalone VM. And I, when I joined my couple of companies ago, I sort of pointed out that if that Nagios box goes down, then nobody's getting any pages for the entire production environment. So that, that needs to be highly available there. But also with monitoring and paging and alerts and errors, um, I've worked with many companies where you get alert fatigue. You just go into your monitoring sy systems and you see so many alerts in there, you're just like, yeah, we, we know those are there, we'll fix them at some point. Alert fatigue is a real thing and it, I, it needs to be dealt with. There should not, the only, well, let's try that again. The, if there's an alert in your monitoring systems, it needs to be dealt with instantly, otherwise it's just a warning, or it doesn't need to be there at all. But more importantly, when do we get alerted? Uh, picture this. There is a runaway transaction on your database. It's churning through transaction log, and that transaction log is getting bigger and bigger, and the free space on the disk is getting smaller and smaller and smaller. When do we get a page for that issue? Do we get a page saying, hey, um, Transaction log of this database is full, you need to go fix it because the database isn't doing anything now. Or do we get page, hey, hey, there's actually quite a lot of unusual log growth going on on your server here. You need to go and take a look at it. Really easy way to uh, test this. Dev server, database. If you want some terrible SQL scripts, I'm your man. Run those, expand that log. When do you get alerted? Nice, simple chaos engineer experiment you can run. Okay, let's do a couple more. Let's do one more. Um, probably the most common uh, common issue that's ever happened with production databases is user error. Who here has ever run an update statement on a production system with and forgotten their where clause? Be honest. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> so, uh, probably... Impact, likelihood, high impact can be really high. So another story, um, working in a job in Ireland a couple of jobs ago. Uh, I was sitting next to a DBA and we were just working there and this was actually on a Tuesday afternoon. And he made, we were working on it and he made a noise that sounded like a sort of squeak shout type thing. And what had happened was a developer had given an update statement to run to get against a voucher table in a production database to update just uh, the amount of discount applied for this one voucher. He would grabbed that update statement, missed the where clause, hit execute in production, and updated the entire table. The outcome of which was, until we fixed it, what a 15% discount was applied to every single transaction that company did. Lots of happy customers, not a lot of happy business owners. Uh, the way we fixed it, point in time restore, Side by side, grab the data, shove it back in. Took us about, it was a 300 gig database. It took us about 20, 25 minutes from him identifying the issue to us actually saying this is complete. This is a tricky one to sort of design engineering, chaos engineering experiments around. Uh, the, the first thing I would ask is, should he have been running an update ad hoc statement against a production system? 
The answer is no. Anything that goes through production needs to go through a deployment pipeline. And this is where the chaos engineering experiments can come in. Grab an update statement, shove it into your deployment pipeline without a where clause, and see what happens. Will it just go straight through and go, yes, it's valid SQL, no bother? Or will it actually flag up that, hang on a second here, there could be a, potentially be an issue with this statement going through? So that's something we can test. I mean, the way we fixed it, because we were, we, it was a startup, so we, were, we weren't there with the deployment pipelines yet, was we actually, got rid of, we actually reduced our AD accounts permissions to read only. So if we wanted to actually do any update statements like this, we had to go through SQL authentication, just to put an extra step. I mean, it's not infallible, but it just made us think about what we were doing before we went and just connected to production. And then we installed and everyone who connected to any production instance had, um, I think it was the SSMS toolkit, I, or toolbox, I can't remember off the top. But um, what that would do is if you ran a, something without a where clause, it would pop up a little flat, a little dialog box saying, hey, this is running without a where clause. Are you sure you want to run this? Again, not infallible because you, know, you get a little bit used to it and go, hey, of course I know what I'm doing, and click OK, and then go, ah. Anyway, last one. I'll do, I'll do one more. Disaster recovery. Who here has got a valid DR plan in their company? Good people, yes. People don't like DR. I've heard some wacky ideas for DR out there. One of them, like, oh, we'll use the staging environment. It's like, <laughs> beg your pardon? And I can understand why people don't like DR. Managers especially don't like DR because it's expensive and you'll hopefully never have to use it. But you need a DR plan and you need to be testing that DR strategy regular basis because once again, that Sunday morning four o'clock issue is going to come up and you really don't want to be hitting you to kick off your DR plan the first time and praying it's just going to work. You want to be sure that when you hit execute, that DR strategy is going to kick in and everything will be sunshine and rainbows. Again, another story. Um, I don't know people, I feel, some of the stuff I've heard about DR is I was like, we're running in a private data center. We don't know the DR plan. They manage everything for us. Uh, so a job I used to work a while ago now, um, they were running in a private data center up in Dublin and they had no DR strategy whatsoever. They, they literally were, we, no, no, we pay for this private data center. They handle everything for us. We don't need DR. Cue about three years ago where that data center had a power outage. Four, four hour outage, completely dead, their entire system's offline. No DR strategy, they were just lumped with it. There's nothing they could have done. They just had to sit there and pray that, you know, the data center's power comes back on at some point. So at that point then, they started thinking about a DR strategy. It was actually longer than four hours. By the time they got everything back up, all their firewall rules were messed up. They were down for about a day. But just highlights that we need a disaster recovery plan and it needs to be tested regularly. Cool. So we've been thinking about all these different things and me telling silly stories about how I've broken stuff. But what we're trying to get here is what failure has the highest likelihood, highest impact, and what will we gain from testing that failure? Remember, we want some actionable results here. We want to come back and say, look, I mean, even if that action is, we ran this test and everything reacted the way we expected to do, because that builds confidence in your systems. The last point there is a really good one, is, is there anything else that can be tested? And it's also kind of unfair, because it's sort of saying, Andrew, is there anything you haven't thought of? And it's like, I don't know, I haven't thought of it. I mentioned getting your team together, sitting them down and talking to them. But don't just talk to your team, talk to the other teams. Talk to your sysadmins, your network admins, your developers, your end users. Because I guarantee you, they will have thought of failures in the systems that you won't have. And those are prime candidates for chaos engineering experiments, especially the ones that will come up with these end users, 100%. So we've talked about, say, past instance analysis, likelihood, impact, map, talking to end users, talking about different scenarios. Let's go ahead and let's have a look at actually running an experiment now. So what failure are you going to test? And we talked about it a little bit. We are going to see what happens if the primary node in an availability group cluster fails. So this is a very simple setup. It's up in my lab in Azure. It is a two node cluster. We have a primary and a secondary. And if anyone doesn't know what an AG is, all it is is a 
method of moving databases from, well, not moving them, but there's two copies of the database. They'll stay online on primary, and then the ones on the secondary will hopefully come online. And there's an endpoint called a listener that moves between the two. And that endpoint is what the applications connect to. So we want to see what happens if the primary node in availability group cluster fails. And hopefully, what will happen is the secondary takes over, the listener comes online on the secondary, everything remains online. So let's define our experiment. We use the scientific method for this, so we define the hypothesis. The listener of the availability group remains online. So what we're going to do is we are going to run a test against the listener before we start the experiment, make sure it's online. And then after the experiment, we'll run a test against the listener to see if it's online. And that'll prove if our AG has failed over as expected, and we can still connect to our databases. Method, how are we going to do this? Now, I said we can do always an ultra-availability group failover, but that's not the way AGs fail out in the wild. So let's just stop the database engine service on the primary node, and let's see what happens. And then roll back. When you're doing these experiments, you need to make sure that you put the systems in the exact same state as you left them, just in case something goes wrong. So what we're going to do here, really simple experiment. We are just going to restart the database engine service on that primary node. Node time. Cool. All righty. Enough of me blabbing. Let's have a look at running an experiment. So let's come into my lab in Azure. All righty, can everyone see at the back? I did check before. My, if, if I could see it, I get you, you can see it, because my eyesight is whew. All righty, so we have our two-node cluster here. We have, ah, uh, yeah, forgot about Zoom it and external monitors. Uh, <laughs> I'm not going to do that again, I'm afraid. Escape that. There we go. So we have um, chaos SQL 01, which is our current primary. And we have chaos SQL 02, which is our current secondary. And then chaos SQL 03 here is our listener of our availability group. This is the endpoint. Now, I said before that we can just hit auto availability group, and the availability group's name is AGDR. And we can fail it over from node 1 to node 2. We've got uh, secondary. There we go. We can see. Should I try and zoom in again? Hey, there we go. <laughs> cool. We can see now that 01 is the secondary and 02 is the primary. So that's a successful failover. If we change connection here and connect into 01 and run again, and hit execute, and we do a refresh. And let's, there we go. We're back to 01 being the primary, 02 being the secondary. So we've tested that our AG can fail over from 01 to 02, back from 02 to 01, using T-SQL. But as I said before, not how your availability group is going to fail out in the wild. So let's design an experiment to test this and see if we just stop the database engine service, what happens. So, okay, if we come down here and have a look, if I show you the experiment. Now, one thing I do like about chaos engineering is there's no sort of, I said at the start, like it's not about tools, it's more of a mindset. So what I'm doing here is just a big long script and most of it is just to make the output look pretty, if I'm honest. Uh, so we have just a listener, we have a bit of a SQL statement here to get the listener. And we have a bit of text here. But then we test the listener's connection using testnet connection. And this is what we're doing here is just making sure that listener is online before we run our experiment. Then we drop that into Pester. Just again, this is making things look pretty. But the main thing then is here is we're not mucking around. We're getting the MS SQL Server database engine service on the primary node and saying stop service force. Just stop immediately. We're then going to wait 10 seconds, because this is in Azure using a load balancer, and the failover can be slightly slow. But once we wait 10 seconds, we are then going to run that test net connection again. If that comes back as succeeded, we have had a successful failover. If something goes wrong, we are actually going to run it again down here, because sometimes when I've done these demos, 
the first time can be a little bit too quick. So we're just going to back off and say, okay, maybe that list will come online in 10 more seconds, and we'll try again. If not, if it, if, so there, sorry, if it does pass, we get a listener is up and running, and it will restart the primary server. If the listener isn't available at all, we'll get a warning message, and we will start all the SQL services back up on that primary node. Just to put that server exactly was as it was before we started the experiment. So, OK, enough blabbing. Let's actually see this in action. Let's run that availability group experiment. So let's make this a bit bigger. And we'll come here. OK, first thing we're doing is we are going to run test net connection against that listener on the 01. So we're going to see if it's online. If it's not online, we're going to stop the experiment. But it should be because we just had a look at it and we were playing around. So this is where this takes a little bit longer than I think it does. And I start to get a little bit nervous. Uh, <laughs> come on, there we go. Listener is online. We are good to go. OK, now we're going to stop the, primary, we're going to stop the services on the primary node. And even with the stop service force, it takes a couple of things to go down. Let's have a look. There we go. Right, so we wait 10 seconds, and then we're going to run that test net connection again. If everything's gone well, this should come back up, and we should be able to connect to the listener. Excellent stuff. Listener is online. We, have restart, we are now restarting our primary server, so we're spinning that back up. We have had a successful chaos engineering experiment. Let's have a look. OK, OK. What we could do here is do a refresh and a refresh. Yep, we can see we have had, oh God, here we go. We have had a failover. O2 is now the primary, and O1 is the secondary. So when we just basically yanked out the primary database engine service, our AG failed over as expected. It is now running on O2, and our AG stayed up, our listener was connectable, and our databases remained online. This has reacted the way we expected to, so we have built confidence in our systems. But we're not done. Because with the T-SQL, we went from 01 to 02. So let's go from 02 to 01. And let's really prove out that our system's working as expected. So let's, oh, there we go. Let's run this one more time. So we're now on 02. 02 is our primary, we're gonna to go to 01. So we're doing the testnet connection against the listener. Listener's online. We're going to stop the service on O2. And this time, we're going to see what happens when we yank out the service from O2. So waiting as before. Here we go. OK, fingers crossed, hopefully. We know we can fail with T-SQL back from O1 to O2 to O2 to O1. So we should be able to have exactly the same thing here. So we've waited our 10 seconds. Testnet connection is running. I can already tell you something's gone wrong here. <laughs> That's timing out. OK, we've had a TCP connect to our listener fail. It's timed out. Nope. OK. OK, I said sometimes in Azure, it takes a little bit of time to fail. Maybe it went over. Let's retry, and let's see if we can get a connection there. Hmm. Nope, something has definitely gone wrong here. This isn't reacting the way we expect it to. We can see it's completely failed. So what we're going to do now is we're going to roll back. We're going to roll back to O2, and we're going to work out exactly what's gone wrong. Yep, we've got a whole bunch of listeners not online. It's throwing errors at us. OK, we've rolled back the experiment. Something has gone horribly, horribly wrong. Let's have a look. OK. So if we come down here, uh, O1 should still be the secondary. Yep, and O2 is still, yeah, OK. Yeah, we can see there, secondary and primary. So we haven't had a successful failover. We yanked out the database engine service on O2, but our AG, instead of being able to fail over back to O1, something's gone wrong, and it stayed on O2. wasn't able to fail over, so we had to roll the whole thing back and bring everything back online. OK, 
any guesses at what went wrong? Remember, we can fail with T-SQL from 01 to 02 to 02 to 01. Any guesses? Yes, sir. Sorry? Look, automatic failover. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the gentleman said it was automatic failover settings. Technically right, yes, actually. Um, we'll have a look at that. The AG is set to automatic failover. If we go into our cluster and we have a look here, <coughs> we do a refresh. We've got a whole bunch of errors. But if we come in here, there we go. And we have, oh, if I can bring that, no, I'm not going to touch it. <laughs> Clustered role AGDR has exceeded its failover threshold. It has exhausted the configured number of failover attempts within its failover period. Yep, you're nodding. Yep, you had it. That is what's caused this issue. And I could, if we come into our clustered role and do properties and then go here and zoom in, these are the settings for that clustered role. The maximum failures in the specified period is one, and the period is six hours. So we can only have, a, have one uncontrolled outage in six hours for that AG, and it will, otherwise it will not fail over. It will just stay on the node that is currently running on the primary and stay in a failed state. That is what has caused this issue with our AG. It doesn't matter. We can fail over with T-SQL all we want, but when we try and actually just yank out the service from the primary node because of these settings, it won't fail over a second time. And I'm not trying to be cute here. Guess what the default settings are for a clustered role? It's this, one failure every six hours. So that is a problem. So let's have a look at that. Um, I'm not saying this is the recommended setting, but let's go for, say, 10 in six hours. Hit OK. And let's try running our experiment again. Actually, when I'm... Right, let's run the experiment first, actually. OK, let's have a go. So is our listener online? Yep, we know it's online, but we're just double checking, making sure that it's available. Listener's online. Wonderful. OK, now we're going to try shutting off the primary node, which is O2. And we're going to see what happens this time. So we're just waiting for SQL Server to go down. Should be one more. There we go. OK, wait 10 seconds. And then we'll see if we've had a successful failover after making that configuration change. OK, waiting for it. Is that listener online? That's taken a little bit longer than I thought it would. Did I actually <laughs> did I make that configuration change? Yep, there we go. Just a little bit longer to make me nervous every time. OK, there we go. We have had a successful chaos engineering experiment. This time, because we made that configuration change and we can fail up to 10 times in a six hour period, that clustered role was able to fail over from 02 to 01. So we've ran our custom, we've run our chaos engineering experiment. We did it twice. We uncovered an issue. We then went and had a look at, we'd look in the SQL Server error logs, and I really hate those clustered logs, because that one that tells us is buried in there all months and nonsense. But we could see it in there. We got there in the end. We made our change, and then we reran our experiment. And this time, our availability group reacted the way we expected it to when it encountered a failure. Now, when I was building this lab, I was doing this test, I had this horrible thought come across my head of, I can't remember the last time I actually checked these settings in my production environment. And true enough, I went and checked them, and there were a few uh, SQL Server clustered roles that were still on the default settings. So even by running a demo in a lab, Chaos Engineering, I got some actionable results that I could take for my production environment. So that is basically a Chaos Engineering experiment in a nutshell. Um, yeah, we, we're all right for time. What I will do is, if we come down and have a look, uh, if I do F11, uh, hello, play ball, please. There we go. Right. Container. So I meant to load this up before the thing. Where is development? Azure. Where is it? Ah, there we go. 
So I did mention at the start, if you're doing stuff like this in Azure, you, have the ability, you also have a really cool thing called, that's not the right lab, the Azure Chaos Studio. And this is a really cool tool that allows you to define chaos engineering experiments in the Azure portal, and you can do some nice stuff. Like if we have a look at this one, these are really basic that I was just playing around with. But instead of using PowerShell to switch off the database engine service, basically what this does, and I can't find it now, if we run here, there we go, details. There we go. It literally is, come here. All, this, all these experiments do is mimic the PowerShell we were running. And instead of just shutting down the database engine service, it actually went and shut down the entire VM, let it bounce, come back up, and then we could analyze to see if the things had, uh, if the AG had failed over from 01 to 02. And then you can combine them. You have different branches doing. You can design pretty complicated things in this. I would argue that if you are doing this type of stuff, keep it as simple as you possibly can. Because if one stuff goes wrong over here while you've got another experiment running over here, you can have a real hard time sort of cobbling it all together and fixing it. But no, there's the, there is the Azure Chaos Studio. Um, really handy tool. Played around with it quite a bit. If PowerShell is your thing, use PowerShell. If not, use this. You can use Python. You can use any tool you want. The best way is to go with what you're most comfortable with to design these experiments. Cool. Okay, so we have about 10 minutes left. All right, so that is pretty much all I wanted to talk to you about um, chaos engineering and SQL Server. Well, not really. What I wanted to do now was talk about something that I've been kind of, the word obsessed has been used over the last few years, and that's SQL Server running on Kubernetes. Anyone here using Kubernetes? Cool, cool. we've got a couple. Right. All Kubernetes is, is it's an orchestrator for containers Basically, it provides a whole bunch of ways of managing large amounts of containers, but key to it is this high availability built in. With Docker, you run Docker on a host. You run your containers there. If you have an issue with your containers or that host, the host goes down. It's a single point of failure. Kubernetes allows you to have a fleet of hosts that if one goes down, the other ones take the workload, workload over. They simulate the, your containers will move from a downed host to a new host. This is something we can test with a chaos engineering experiment. But also, Kubernetes has this concept of running state versus desired state. We define our desired state in a YAML file and say, this is how we want our deployment to look like. When we push that into Kubernetes, it then becomes our running state. And Kubernetes is constantly checking between the two to see if there are any differences. If there are, Kubernetes will automatically fix them for us. So let's go and have a look at a quick demo. Of Kubernetes, let's bring this down a little bit. Okay. So I'm gonna make sure I've got my connection into my cluster here. Just kube control get nodes. Kube control is just a command line tool to interact with Kubernetes. There we go, kube cuttle, kube ctl, kube control. What I'm gonna do here is deploy one instance of SQL Server to my Kubernetes cluster. Just using this YAML file. I don't wanna go into the YAML because it, is anyone here like YAML? No. So let's have a look. We've got our deployment. Yay, SQL's up and running. It's in what's called a pod, and we've got our service here. And the service gives us our endpoint, that external IP. So we can grab that IP address and connect into SQL and run just one query against it saying select at that version. And there we go, this is 2019 CU5. Yay, we've got SQL running in our Kubernetes cluster. Our desired state is one instance of SQL Server, our running state is one instance of SQL Server. Uh, that's not what I wanted to do. So, if we have a look at that pod, we can see it's got an IP address of 10.224.1.28. What we do now is grab that pod's name and delete it. 
At this point, Kubernetes should realize that our running state no longer matches our desired state and automatically fix it for us. And if we have a look here, boom, we have our new pod. We can see there it's 10.224.1.29. All good. So that is Kubernetes automatically fixing a dead pod. It's called a reconciliation loop, where it checks between the running state and the desired state. So um, this all came about because I wanted to start looking at possibly running SQL Server in Kubernetes in a previous job. And oh, actually, we can get that server, run that query again, actually, and make sure everything's working. If we can still connect in, there we go. There we go. New pods up. We can still connect. Let's come back into the slides for a minute. All right. So that's just running one pod of SQL Server. We're then deleting it, testing it, spinning it up. Um, we're using Kubernetes built-in high availability. We don't have to mess around with anything in SQL. It's just built into Kubernetes. Now, I demoed this to my boss, and he sort of said to me, yes, Andrew, it's great, but it's very codey, very dry. When we demoed this to, say, the C-level people, would you be able to jazz it up a little bit? Like, jazz it up a little bit. Like, jazz hands? I, I don't know. So I went out and started looking about a way to make demoing SQL Server high availability on Kubernetes a little bit more jazzy. And I found a project on GitHub. called Kube Invaders. This is using Space Invaders to test SQL Server, high well, any sort of high availability on Kubernetes using Space Invaders. Our, our applications are the invaders, and we play the spaceship. And this is how I demoed SQL Server in Kubernetes on high availability to the C-level people in my company. If we do that. We should now have 10. Say we've got 10 pods running SQL Server. If I then grab this, let's grab here, drop it into here. We can watch them there. And here are my pods, and I can play my game. And I can start killing them, bringing them off here. <laughs> and we can see that they're coming back really quickly because Kubernetes is automatically spinning them back up faster than the GUI can. And so, you know, what I can do is just hit start, and I can let it play itself. And there we go. We can see that it's going off. The two server things there are actually stress tests for the nodes and the clusters. So what I'll do is just start running jobs and burning through CPU. And then we can start killing off all the pods and killing the servers as well. And we can see Kubernetes trying to keep up here. I mean, eventually it will just completely and utterly keel over because it can't keep up. You're not supposed to do this type of thing to your applications running in Kubernetes. But this is how I demonstrated SQL Server high availability in Kubernetes to the C-level people in the company I worked for. You may or may not be surprised that I no longer work there. <laughs> That'll go all day. And we can see now that yeah, it eventually, see, we, it's, it's not keeping up at all. So we can just cancel that, and we can stop the game here. How are we doing in time? Five minutes. OK. Excellent stuff. OK. So. That is everything I have for you. I've got some resources for you here. Now, um, the top one there is where I said the start to start off with uh, getting involved with chaos engineering, and that is the principles of chaos.org website. Um, loads of resources. I highly recommend you check it out. The QR code will take you to the repo of my GitHub where all the slides and the demo code that we've been doing are available. We have the chaostoolkit.org, which is a really cool thing where you can drop your own custom scripts into it, and it'll run your chaos engineering experiment for you, but it'll give you a whole load of really like in-depth logs and stuff like that. I highly recommend you check that out. Um, this one here, Awesome Chaos Engineering, is just a great GitHub repo with hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of links, well, not hundreds, tens and tens and tens of links of really good resources that you can go and check out. And then finally, there's the bottom one there. It's my favorite GitHub repo of all time. It's the Kube Invaders repo. Thank you so much. Enjoy the rest of the day.